Sean Sellers, that young man that turned into a killer. You're going to hear firsthand how it happened. You're going to hear some things that you better think about. I challenge you to heed what you're going to see and hear in this video. Heed what you're going to see. Do not deny it, for that's only going to fan the fire. Sean Sellers first began to appear in the local news in Oklahoma City when he was arrested in March 1986 for the murder of his mother and his stepfather. He was also charged with the unrelated murder of a convenience store clerk the previous fall. His friend Richard Howard III, who was present for the first murder and assisted with the attempt to conceal the second two, was also charged with first-degree murder, but agreed to testify against Sellers in exchange for a reduced charge and five years probation. Howard was also able to provide the handguns used in the murders. Sellers was found guilty and sentenced to death. His case began to attract national attention after his initial defense strategy cited involvement in Satanism and an addiction to the popular role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons as grounds for diminished capacity. At the same time, the satanic panic had begun to reach critical mass in the United States. The story of a clean-cut, all-American, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy turned crazed killer by satanic forces made Sean Sellers an ideal poster child for the satanic panic. An early and vocal adoption of Christianity was an asset to these efforts as well. Mainstream media could sensationalize the more deviant aspects of the Sean Sellers story, while evangelicals had a bona fide death row testimony validating their concerns about the dangers of the occult. In the early 1990s, as the satanic panic was falling out of fashion, Sean was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder, known today as dissociative identity disorder. He continued to build support from high-profile advocates against capital punishment from around the world. They contended that his age at the time of the crimes, as well as a verified diagnosis of a severe mental illness, should disqualify execution as a reasonable punishment. At the same time, Sean began developing a following through his prison ministry work, as well as individual friendships he made through correspondence. Ultimately, his appeals were unsuccessful, and an 11th hour clemency hearing denied. And on February 4th, 1999, Sean Sellers was executed by lethal injection at McAllister State Prison. Today, Sean Sellers is the only person executed in the United States for a crime committed under the age of 17 since the reinstatement of the death penalty by the Supreme Court in 1976 and their decision in 2005 to bar it in any case involving an offender under the age of 18. It is rightfully a significant case in the history History of U.S. criminal law and will undoubtedly be referenced in future debates on capital punishment. For this reason, an objective reevaluation of the case facts may be worthwhile. Today, we're going to attempt to cut through the media noise and the many contradicting, agenda driven narratives in hopes of taking a fresh look at the case apart from the hype. We will examine some of the explanations which have been presented over the years and how they are supported by the evidence. In the early morning hours of September 8, 1985, Sean Sellers and Richard Howard have been loitering for an extended period of time at the Circle K at 12237 North Council Road in Oklahoma City when the two lure Robert Bauer, the clerk on duty overnight, to Howard's Camaro, ostensibly to show Robert the new clutch plate that Howard had installed. From this point on, accounts vary considerably, particularly with regards to Richard Howard's role in the events that followed. However, what is known is that soon after, Sellers follows Robert back inside, carrying a 357 Magnum. He aims the gun at Robert, who is at that point behind the counter, sipping on a cup of coffee. And just as he looked up at me, I pulled the gun up and fired. And I missed. It, I wasn't used to this revolver, and it had more kick to it than I was used to. And I missed. It whizzed right by his head. He slipped and fell just as I fired again and it grazed his shoulder. The second shot enters roughly between his left ear and his left eye. The bullet flattens inside his skull, slightly behind and slightly below his right ear, passing just behind and barely missing his spinal cord. And it grazed his shoulder. A wounded Robert attempts to shield himself with his work coat as he scrambles for safety towards the back of the coolers. And he ran this way, and I was already coming this way, and he almost ran into me. When I fired the gun, he was only about a foot and a half, two feet away from me. And he'd hold, he was holding up some kind of a coat and was bent down. And um, when the bullet hit him, it knocked him down and blood splattered all over the wall. The third shot enters a few inches below his left armpit. It travels through his left ventricle, lung, diaphragm, and spleen. And blood splattered the wall and he fell. 
as Robert Bauer lays bleeding to death on the floor. Sellers and Howard leave undetected. And so basically we went in there and we took nothing. Took no merchandise, we took no money. We took nothing. The two reportedly drive by the Circle K an hour or so later to see if he had been found yet. He would be found around 2.05 that morning by a nurse on her way to work. Because this killing was without apparent motive, the police had no suspects. Five months went by and no one knew, except for Sean's close friend. Howard would later phone in a tip to the homicide detectives about a pickup he'd seen that evening at the gas station. Around midnight on March 5, 1986, at the Belafato home at 7139 Northwest 115th Street, Lee and Vonda Belafato are asleep in their bed. An angry, confused, destructive young man went to bed in this room as he walked down this hall to his parents' bedroom. Wearing only black underwear to limit blood spatter, Sellers enters the bedroom carrying the 44 Magnum that he had snuck from Lee's nightstand earlier that evening. And yeah, pointing the gun my father's head and I squeeze the trigger. At point blank range, Sellers shoots Lee slightly above and behind the left ear. The bullet travels through the left occipital lobe, transects the brainstem at the pons, and exits in front of his right ear. And I immediately lifted the gun where I knew my mother's head was. I couldn't see it anymore because the flash had blinded me, but I knew where it was, and I squeezed the trigger again. Sellers then fires at his mother, Vonda. The first shot hits above and behind the right ear. It passes through the right occipital lobe and lacerates the cerebral cortex before exiting through the left upper eyelid. And then she raised her head up and I fired a third time and her head fell. As Vonda's head turns to the right toward Sellers, a second shot enters her right cheek at the nose. It exits through her left cheek slightly lower. While it takes out her palate and facial bones, the second shot only causes superficial damage. The first shot ends up being the fatal shot. Sellers flips the lights on repeatedly to make sure there's no movement. He then washes up, and in an effort to stage the scene to look like a home invasion, he leaves the side door open before heading to Richard Howard's home in Piedmont. The two hide the gun and devise a plan. Then, Sellers goes to sleep. Later that morning, Sellers and Howard, along with Howard's new wife, Tracy Hawks, return to the Bello Fado home under the pretense that they are on their way to school. Sellers discovers the bodies inside and runs back out, hysterically yelling, Blood! There's blood everywhere! Neighbors intervene and the police are soon called. Satan said to Sean Sellers, there's no way out. In the Devil Made Me Do It version of events, Sean Sellers' journey into the occult began at age 10, when a babysitter took him to the library and unwittingly exposed him to satanic or witchcraft-related literature, piquing an increasing interest. Later on, a Wiccan would give a speech at his high school, where she would claim involvement in human sacrifices, and reportedly possessed a piece of human skin as proof. Sellers later got in touch with this Wiccan, who gave him instructions on how to pray to Satan in order to harness black magic, where he's told the real power lays. Well, if you want real power, go black magic. And I said, okay, let's go black magic. After some initial reluctance, Sellers follows through with these instructions. It was like something that I'd seen in all these movies that I was so interested in. And I was thinking exorcist type stuff, you know? After which he describes many cold, dead hands, beginning to touch him all over, along with hearing voices, which he believed to be a demon named Ezurate. It was Ezurate within him, and keep in mind that on the witness stand, the Oklahoma prosecution did not want to acknowledge that Satan was a part of this at all. Really? From there, he began to perform satanic rituals and started to recruit others for a coven that he called the Elimination whose goal was to destroy Christianity. We named our coven the Elimination, and our purpose was to get rid of Christianity, you know, to wipe it out. Sellers stated that he had as many as 13 recruits for his organization at one point. I was really avidly involved in it, and everyone else was kind of like, well, let's try it out, okay? 
Was there anybody else involved besides you and Richard? Yeah, there were other people, but uh, we were the ones who were setting it all up. We were the ones that were doing okay. it. Richard and I However, as interest died down, Sellers and Richard Howard continued conducting satanic rituals. Sellers was seen by classmates drinking blood in school. He claimed he would carry around a vial of blood because he had become addicted to the taste. In the Devil Made Me Do It version of events, the rationale behind murdering Robert Bauer was that Sellers had reportedly broken all of the Ten Commandments, except thou shalt not kill. He would carry out murder to conclusively declare his allegiance to Satan. Sellers would also state that he performed a destruction ritual in the lead-up to the murder of Lee and Von de Bellafato. At trial, Sean Sellers' initial defense was that Satanism, along with an addiction to Dungeons and Dragons, had rendered him legally unconscious during the time of the murders. Neuropsychologist Herman Jones was brought in to provide expert testimony to support this theory. However, halfway through the trial, it was clear that this strategy was ineffective and his counselor switched to a more traditional insanity defense, this time enlisting the help of psychologist Martin Krimsky to support this theory. Unfortunately, the prosecutor now had Dr. Jones's assessment, which included a diagnosis of sociopathy, to contradict this new defense, and the two expert testimonies effectively canceled each other out. Evidence presented at trial supporting Sean's involvement in Satanism, aside from testimony from friends, included satanic writings in a notebook. The notebook itself was not allowed to be introduced at trial because it mostly consisted of geometry and history homework, irrelevant to what the defense was trying to prove. However, the portions that did contain drawings and writings of an occult nature, roughly 15% of the contents of the notebook, were introduced as evidence. Additional evidence supporting Sean Sellers' involvement in Satanism included photographs of a satanic altar in Sellers' bedroom and a paper he'd written on Satanism for English class that year. In the essay, Sellers writes... I can kill without remorse, and I feel no regret or sorrow, only love, compassion, hate, anger, pain, and joy. Only I may understand, but that is enough. It's clear that certainly, at the time of the murders, Seller's understanding of Satanism had very little to do with the teachings of Anton LaVey and the Satanic Bible. Seller superficially cites some passages of the Satanic Bible, but he appears to have been equally influenced by ninjutsu. He even acknowledges in his confession that his ultimate belief system at that point was a combination of principles of ninjutsu, including a very unusual interpretation of the concept of Zen. I got involved in Zen. And in Zen, in Zen, okay. Zen Buddhism, you know, mm -hmm. and in Zen, you were taught that life is a series of paths. And paths come to a T, and paths comes to an X, and Ys, etc. It doesn't matter how it happened, it doesn't matter if it's murder, or if it's an accident, or sickness, or whatever, it's just, it just happens. Karma is karma. And this new philosophy said that it really doesn't matter, because karma is karma. You know, it's going to happen. And, uh... So there was no right and wrong there anymore. Relax relaxation techniques and stuff. And elements of Satanism that suited his master vision. In all likelihood, the appeal of Satanism to Sean Sellers lied as much in its aesthetic as a means of seeking attention of his peers, presenting an element of danger. And I had a lot of respect and a lot of fear from the people who knew me. And antagonizing older generations, as teenagers have done throughout the years. Here in the studio we have Tom Wedge. Tom is a police officer. He is a specialist on the occult. He has been a consultant on over 200 satanic related crimes. He was called, interestingly enough, by Sean Seller's defense attorney to testify on Sean's behalf. During Geraldo's primetime Halloween special, Wedge can even be seen running interference for Sellers when he's struggling to keep up with script. It's likely that Wedge offered extensive coaching so that, as Sellers discussed his involvement with Satanism, he might come off sounding more authoritative or knowledgeable, or at least in presenting the version of Satanism that was being marketed at the time. Sean, Sean had broken every one of the Ten Commandments except thou shalt not commit murder. And after he worshipped before the altar and, uh, with, uh, and asked for powers from Satan, uh, he went out to, to do this. Uh, technically, it was a... Now I got that scar there. I remember doing that one. That was whenever I got my satanic name. That was where I sacrificed blood to Satan. I uh, got introduced to a witch, and she took me in as her disciple and taught me for a while and got me involved in Satanism. When we read between the lines, all evidence seems to suggest that the Wiccan speech at Sean Sellers High School took place in the year he lived in Greeley, Colorado, which he described as the happiest time of his life, citing involvement in Civil Air Patrol, football, and other healthy activities. 
This girl gave a speech to the school about being a witch and seeing the human sacrifice, and she had a piece of human skin as proof. She had a piece of human skin where she was witness to a human sacrifice. A girl gave a speech. That was a sanctioned by the school? Mm-hmm. But this would also be the year that a friend of his would see this Wiccan give the speech. Not Sellers himself, but the friend. A girl gave a speech to her school. Tanya knew that I was interested in Dungeons and Dragons and witchcraft and things like that. It was, I don't know, I don't know if it was in her speech class or something. I don't know exactly how it, what it was, but she gave a speech and Tanya heard it. And Tanya heard it. Tell Sellers about it. She heard this witch give a uh, speech at her school. And give Sellers this person's phone number. It appears their interactions in total amounted to this one phone call. She took me in as her disciple and taught me for a while. Where this Wiccan, who went by the name of Glashion, provided Sean with instructions on how to pray to Satan. I said, what's the first thing I have to do? And he said, she said, pray to Satan. And I thought, pray to the devil. And <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, so it took me a few days. To it's entirely possible she was trolling him altogether, making up much of what she said as she was going along. Her instructions included invoking the name Glashion as much as Beelzebub. Pray to Satan, using Satan's name, and then use this, inc this special incantation she told me, and use her, her satanic name, Glashion. And um, I closed my eyes tight, you know, like... like <coughs> As erotic. But regardless, Greeley is where Sellers said things were going best for him. He cites involvement in positive pro-social activities, but this is also where he gets involved with Satanism. It is in Greeley that he develops the idea of the elimination, according to a friend from Colorado who testified at trial. He was obsessed with Satanism. Sean would often claim to perform Satanic rituals on a regular basis, but whenever discussing this, he would remain generally vague. When I first started my rituals and stuff, I began with the pentagram and with, you know, magic circles and stuff. In every school, you've got kids who are interested in the occult. And they go out and they get a copy of the Satanic Bible, Satanic Rituals, Necromicron, you know. Uh, then uh, I happened upon a book called the Necromicron. And it's the Book of the Dead is what it's trans translated as. Uh, reading, memorizing my Satanic Bible, memorizing the Necromicron and stuff. A point of contention, in particular, among Satanists who questioned his credibility. The Satanic Bible in America outsells the Bible 10 to 1 on college campuses. 10 Christians, you know, equal one Satanist. By this time, Sean and Richard were deeply involved in their Satanic rituals, but it wasn't a game or a fad. It was a way of life, and it led to this store and cold-blooded murder. When discussing the devil made me do it version of events, Sellers would often cite his motivation of wanting to break all Ten Commandments to prove his allegiance to Satan. We had to break the Ten Commandments, one by one, all of them. And that would prove that we were totally against God and didn't want to have anything to do with God, didn't respect his laws, didn't respect his rules, didn't respect anything about him, were completely and totally evil and completely and totally devoted to Satan. And we began to do that, one by one. The first few were easy, I mean, you know, you shall not commit adultery, no problem, you know. Uh, you shall not lie, or you shall not steal, you know. Those things, no problem whatsoever. And we broke all of them easily except for one, you shall not murder. But he never explains exactly how he went about breaking the fourth commandment, or the tenth. It's also worth recognizing the role of Christianity in the context of Sellers' environment. Oklahoma, in particular, was a hub of the burgeoning televangelism industry at the time. Sellers himself acknowledges going to Bible camp one summer. When I was 13, I went to Falls Creek, which is a Baptist uh, youth camp here in, in Oklahoma. I uh, was having some problems with a, uh, a girlfriend. I uh, was praying, Lord, just make her love me. You know, that's all I ask for. I'll be good if you make her love me. I was trying to make a deal with God. And whenever she broke up with me and told me that she didn't want to have anything to do with me, I blamed God. I got mad at God. He made a pact with Jesus at the time to win the affections of a girl he'd fallen for and became spiteful of God when she rejected him. He would talk about watching occult fear porn on Trinity Broadcasting Network for the lulls. I remember on Trinity Broadcasting Network they had a show about it and I sat there for an hour and a half and laughed, laughed, completely laughed at these idiots who were talking about Dungeons and Dragons being the devil's game and how it can lead you into Satanism and how it can lead you down the primrose path and stuff. 
And I was thinking, no way, look at these fools. But then spend over two hours on their prayer line when he wanted out of Satanism. I uh, called TBN one day, the Trinity Broadcasting Network in Oklahoma City. And I talked to some lady there. And when she found out that I was involved in Satanism, and she found out that I was and stuff, she said, oh, you've been involved with those witches and stuff then, right? And I went, yeah. And she said, can I pray? And I went, sure. Arguably, the evangelical campaign to present devil worship as a credible and immediate threat gave Satanism its greatest potency. Those who accept Christian doctrine as the established authority by default are going to be more receptive to the notion that Lucifer is employing comparable supernatural forces to Shanghai souls for spiritual warfare. I heard um, Anton LaVey's daughter say that uh, these um, babies who are being sacrificed, you know, they're it's not Satanism or she wouldn't answer to saying that it was. The fact of the matter is the kids are abducted, teenagers are drawn into the occult, and a lot of them are being used for uh, occult um, sacrifices. And whether you believe that Satan has power, whether you believe that Satan can, can give you the things that he's promising these kids, that's immaterial, my friend, because they believe it. Interestingly, in the Satanist narrative, Sellers sometimes mentions that he and Richard Howard had performed a lust ritual next to Howard's house. Aside from the questions this raises about what a lust ritual between two adolescent males exactly entails, and what kind of implications that might have regarding their dynamics, it gives us a possible timeline of events on the evening of September 8, 1985. We know they were driving Howard's Camaro that evening. So presumably Howard would have traveled from his home in Piedmont to pick up sellers at his home in Oklahoma City. From there they traveled to Edmond to Richard's grandfather's house where they retrieved the 357 Magnum, drive back to Howard's house in Piedmont to conduct the lust ritual, then to the Circle K, which is barely over a mile from sellers' home, to murder Robert Bauer. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons led me into witchcraft, which led me into Satanism. The second component of Sean Seller's initial legal unconsciousness defense was his addiction to the role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons. According to this defense, his addiction to the game had obscured his perception of reality so much he could no longer distinguish the game from the real world, and was therefore acting as though he was playing within the rules and norms of a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. You see, psychologists use role-playing as therapy because it's so powerful. In practice, Sellers played in a total of one campaign at age 13 and was dungeon master for two over the course of three years. And we played three different campaigns, which is really unusual for someone playing like that. But I was dungeon master in two of them, and then I played a 10th level fighter in the third one. As dungeon master, it's clear that Sean was enthusiastic about world building. In Escaping Satan's Web, he goes into detail about researching a mythical dragon that could only be defeated by a riddle. I was going to try to find a mythological dragon from the past, bring it back to life in Dungeons and Dragons. I wanted to teach him that mental, you know, aspect. It's clear he took a lot of pride and satisfaction in this aspect of being a dungeon master. His enthusiasm for world building and storytelling would also be seen later in works such as Schulador, his compilation of poetry, Don John Hofen, a graphic novel he wrote and illustrated, as well as a novel that was written but not published, titled The Princess Warrior. In addition to Dungeon Master, Seller's character was also reportedly a 10th level fighter. Based on this information and the chronology of events, it's most likely that Sean was operating from the 1981 second edition basic Dungeons and Dragons rule set, along with the Expert Rules expansion, which supported character ranks 4 through 14. According to these rule books, as a 10th level fighter, Sean would have reached the first level of Lord, the highest title in this class. At the time, the maximum level a fighter could reach was level 36. It's interesting that Sellers would choose Fighter for his character class as a D&D player. He often discussed a lifelong interest in seeking out spiritual answers through different means. He would regularly discuss the appeal of Satanism in particular, offering access to supernatural sources of power. And I like that power, you know, that power of being in control. Yet he chose the character class that does not permit the use of spells or any other magic. I played it for three years, and he was 10th level. Now, this character was my friend, this character was me. It's possible that Sellers' Dungeons and Dragons character reflected an ideal sense of self. We know throughout his life that Sean Sellers struggled with gender norms imposed on him by his family culture 
and how these were at odds with his internal experiences. Sean often strove to fit the mold of what it meant to be masculine, as defined by the men in his life. He may have picked fighter out of a morality based around the principle of might is right, and throughout many of his writings and interviews, a clear pattern of obsession over strength and weakness emerges. As an aside, for the what kind of D&D character would I be survey, I answered the 140 questions to the best of my ability, as Sean would have answered, or as corroborated by documented behavior. Interestingly, the results produced a character that is a chaotic, evil human warlock, which would be arguably more congruent with Sean Sellers' values and choices during the time of the murders. There is a way out. In 1987, psychiatrist Dorothy Lewis interviewed Sellers following his trial. She indicated that Sellers was chronically psychotic and exhibited symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. She added that he had poor touch with reality and was overwhelmed by fantasy. She would later testify on his behalf at his clemency hearing in 1999. Uh, he used to stick a pin through his own penis, and he used to slam a window down on his penis. In 1992, a group of three mental health experts formally diagnosed Sean Sellers with multiple personality disorder, today known as dissociative identity disorder. The experts reported that testing revealed at least two to three distinct alter personalities. One of them was named Danny. Danny in particular was left-handed, which Sean was not. The other alter personality was named the controller. The argument when this information was brought to light at his 1995 appeal was that one of these personalities, which is unlikely to have understood the difference between right and wrong, must have been in executive control of Sellers' person or body at those times, and as such, the person known as Sean Sellers was not guilty. A central component of Sellers' 1995 appeal was that multiple personality disorder was relatively unknown during his 1986 trial, and it was only through the advances in scientific knowledge since then that that it became possible to identify the condition. In 1986, the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association would have been the standard text at the time. The DSM-3 does include a section on multiple personalities, along with three diagnostic criteria. However, testing and awareness of the condition at the time was still limited. Public perception of MPD at the time was mostly informed by the 1976 TV movie Sybil, starring Sally Field. One methodology used to diagnose sellers with multiple personality disorder is called quantitative electroencephalogram, or QEEG, also known as brain mapping. Much in the same way that an electrocardiogram measures the electrical impulses in the heart through sensors attached to the skin, an electroencephalogram measures electrical activity in the brain. A quantitative electroencephalogram uses additional sensor points to create 3D images for a more comprehensive brain mapping. At the time, the theory suggested that fluctuations in brain activity could indicate switches between alternate personalities. And they hooked me up to this EEG machine, put all these electrodes all over my head, laid me down, mapped my brain, sent it off to the neurologist, and it came back and they said, shows different brain waves for different alter personalities. And this is the best part. In 1992, using QEEG testing to diagnose multiple personality disorder was being explored as part of the research in developing the fourth edition of the DSM, which would be published in 1994. It was ultimately never validated or formally adopted for this purpose. Today, QEEG testing is shown to be helpful in revealing or confirming conditions such as anxiety, depression, seizures, insomnia, epilepsy, head injuries, brain tumors, or memory problems. In the 1992 report, the QEEG testing did show signs of a traumatic brain injury, which was attributed to an incident from Seller's childhood, though the exact details of this aren't available. Another testing method used to support Seller's diagnosis of MPD was evoked potential testing, which basically detects the time between a sensory input and the brain's response. It was held up as supporting the incontrovertible evidence of Sellers' disorder because it reportedly cannot be falsified by the patient. Sean, you can't fake this. You have MPD. Accept it. It's true. But then, reluctantly, I had to admit that it explained some things. 
Today, EPT is recognized as useful in diagnosing multiple sclerosis and other neurological conditions. It has never been formally adopted for diagnosing multiple personality disorder. Sean Sellers would claim amnesia during the events of the murders. I woke up in jail cell. I didn't know where I was, what was going on. And a guy came by and says, hey, heard they got you for uh, killing your parents. And I went, what? No, nah, no way. And that's a lie. And then they came by the next day and said, hey, got, heard they got you for another one. Some convenience store operator. I was going, no. So I was expecting him to come by and say, hey, here they got you for another one, because I didn't really know what was happening. And later stated it would take him several years to recall these events, and only through exhaustive therapy efforts. Following the murder of Robert Bauer in 1985, Sean reportedly bragged to several friends about it at school. This would suggest that he had full awareness of this act at the time. We were so proud of ourselves. Multiple personality disorder was highlighted during Sellers' 1995 appeal because not only could it account for his memory gaps, but it also presented a confirmed severe mental health diagnosis that, if not exonerating, should at least be taken into account when reconsidering his death sentence. It's, it has many psychotic symptoms with uh, hallucinations and delusions, so that to hold a person entirely responsible for his or her acts I, I think doesn't make any sense. One of the personalities did the killing and needs to be held accountable. It's worth noting that there are no reports of Sellers displaying signs of multiple personality disorder prior to the murders or in the years following his trial. I was pretty well acquainted with him for quite a while. I have never seen anything personally that would indicate anything of that nature. At his 1999 clemency hearing, one of the correctional officers at McAllister State Penitentiary testified observing Sellers being coached on how to present with symptoms of MPD by his attorney's team. Today, dissociative identity disorder is widely thought to be a subconscious survival mechanism in response to trauma in early life. Evidence-based best practices for treating dissociative identity disorder focus on establishing safety, stabilization, and symptom reduction, confronting, working through, and integrating traumatic memories, and skills training and integration. It rarely seeks to or succeeds in reconciling memories from different personalities, such as when a secondary alter acts in a manner at odds with the host personality. It's also worth noting the extent of deliberation and planning that went into each murder. Bauer was chosen as the target at least a week in advance, and Sellers acknowledged fantasizing about killing Vonda for some time. And I began to do destruction rituals on him, and I began to have a dream over and over again that I had killed him. And the best way I can describe it is one day I woke up and it was no longer a dream. Despite Sellers owning a shotgun himself, in both instances, he had the foresight to seek out a weapon that wouldn't be traced back to him. There's no evidence that any of these murders were carried out in the heat of the moment. One finding which came out of Sellers' 1992 testing and was overlooked at the time, was evidence of a traumatic brain injury. Very little was understood about TBI at the time, and it was only after a number of famous NFL players began to exhibit erratic behavior and personality changes post-career that researchers began to explore the link between concussions and these kind of changes. Traumatic brain injury can account for impulse control issues, explosive anger, and short-term and long-term memory loss which in theory might better explain some of Seller's behavior at the time. However, therapy for traumatic brain injury focuses on compensation strategies for the functional deficits that the injured person experiences. It focuses on how to be able to live life within the limitations of the injury. TBI therapy does not focus on memory retrieval. TBI is non-reversible, and while functionality can often be improved, there is currently no cure. Another aspect to consider in trying to understand Sean Sellers' frame of mind when he committed the murders is his substance use. Sellers reportedly abused amphetamines and cannabis on a near daily basis during his junior year. I began to take speed to keep going. And I began, you know, I smoked joints and stuff with my classmates at school during lunch. And that would knock me down and I'd take speed to get back up. Both of these substances are well known to exacerbate symptoms of severe mental illnesses, as well as impulse and anger control problems. Prolonged stimulant use compounds these concerns by adding the impact of sleep deprivation on the decision-making process. We know that Sellers had been awake on speed for three nights prior to the murder of the Belafados. 
I've been up for three days on speed, and then basically the best way I can explain it is I woke up and it was no longer a dream, it was reality. Two recurring themes which are seen throughout Sean Sellers' interviews and writings are power and the concept of manhood. Sellers was obsessed with the notion of control. He was clearly angry whenever he felt subordinated and sought to gain control, power, and dominance through whatever means available. I was invoking demons and asking them to enter my body to give me power. He was trying to feed that uh, power that he was receiving. You know, I thought the Satan, the Satanists were all-powerful and everything. He had a very Machiavellian attitude when it came to domination, which also tied in with his concept of manliness. His biological father was out of the picture by the age of three. Sellers had made multiple attempts to reconnect with his father before and after the murders, and it appears these efforts were one-sided. Dad, you know, Rick, he had a girlfriend at that time, and uh, his girlfriend came out and told me, I was playing in the yard or something one night, his girlfriend told me, you know, your daddy loves you. And I was thinking, well, why doesn't he tell me that? Sellers admired Lee and referred to him as dad. He often talked about seeking and never receiving Lee's approval. He discusses the notions of strength versus weakness, and in particular, attempting to conform to traditional cis-heteronormative parameters of masculinity, recognizing brute strength as the defining characteristic of this, and emotions and empathy as weakness. If you cry, you're weak. Anger, you know, that's strength. Seller's fixation on power can also be attributed in part to, by all accounts, an unstable upbringing. Sellers consistently told of Vonda and Lee adopting an itinerant lifestyle when they took on work as over-the-road truck drivers. As a result, from the age of five, Sean was shuffled between his grandfather, Jim Blackwell, and an assortment of aunts and uncles. While he spent much of the next 11 years in the state of Oklahoma, outside his time in Colorado, he had briefly moved back to his birthplace of Southern California around age eight. He described this experience as particularly traumatic. He noted that he was the target of bullying and sexual molestation by an older relative during this time. Things stabilized somewhat by the age of 14, when Sean was at least back living full-time with Vonda and Lee. However, by this point, he felt that his efforts to exceed in school and extracurricular activities were not getting recognized. Another thing that the trappings of Satanism provided for Sean Sellers was attention, which appears to be a prominent motivator throughout his life. It seemed like I was always born to be a leader. Even when I was getting in trouble, I was always getting everyone else in trouble around me. Everything that I always put my hand to always came out, you know, I always excelled at it. It always came out great. If I got in trouble, I got in trouble good, you know, or if I did it right, it was very, very right. You know, I was the best lineman on the team and stuff. And I set some high school speed records when I was still in junior high. School was always easy for me. In fact, it was boring. For I can give back to society infinitely more than I ever took away and my death would be a waste. You know, I have a ministry called Radical Teens for Christ. Devil Child author Vicki Dawkins was one of the first people to interview him after his conviction. She would later state, Sean has always been a boaster, and he craves publicity. He had maintained this code of silence throughout his trial, and he was dying to talk. He would often describe his penchant for drinking blood as a compulsion or addiction. One particularly telling aspect of this is the manner in which he would choose to carry this out. By most accounts, Sellers often sought out an audience to drink blood in front of. I ate a, fr a fr leg off of a live frog, and the whole class went, Shh, <laughs> and that drew a lot of attention to me. I got caught drinking blood in a, my uh, history class one day, and that drew a lot of attention and stuff to me. And he clearly appreciated the attention that he received for doing so, positive or otherwise. Then I got caught with my satanic Bible and stuff at school, and that really drew a lot of attention. A lot of attention and stuff. Whenever I began to really understand and realize that I was guilty, I wanted to die. I felt that, that would be right. I felt that that was the only way I could pay for the things that I'd done. And to forgive myself was a big step. It took a long time. It was, was not easy for me. But I had forgiven myself. And that's why I don't cry anymore when I talk about it, you know. I have a question that I've been asking everybody, and no one's given me an answer with for it yet. My question is this. After a man has done something horrible, after he's killed, or after he's done something that he can never take away, is there anything he can ever do to make up for it? No one's been able to give me an answer to that yet. 
I would really like to have an answer before I die. From the initial media coverage at the time of his arrest through the present day, the focus of this story has been squarely on the perpetrator, as Sean Sellers continued to cultivate his death row celebrity status, his three victims were effectively reduced to NPCs. Any discussion of Vonda and Lee Belafato has been largely confined to their suitability as parents. And uh, mom felt like you shouldn't take family problems to other people, okay? If mom had been willing to take and go outside the family to find that help, if that's what it took, would mom be alive today? Ultimately, yes. While Robert Bauer's name is seldom mentioned at all. I didn't want to uh, hear no, you know, and I didn't want to be told what to do. I felt that this was my life. I could choose my friends, and especially my girlfriend. He was an ex-Green Beret, and he was a problem. You know, he was dangerous. Sean was just 15 years old when he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for three cold-blooded murders. A pimple-faced 16-year-old kid didn't even understand half the process. The 16-year-old had a mental illness. 16-year-old mentally ill person. Severely, physically and sexually abused, particularly sexually. Sellers is bright with no background of abuse. A student, football player, what have you. A football player holding down a 40 hour a week job plus I mean not a not a not a dropout because he only missed a half a day unexcused absence the whole last year of his high school career he is a shining candle there will never be another Sean Sellers ever a 16 year old with malice with intent with premeditation manipulative sociopathic cold-blooded killer a very cold-blooded person who killed a total stranger just to find out how it feels. Killed a woman who carried him in her, in her womb and gave birth to him. As he spoke of what he discovered when he went into the house, uh, he made sounds like crying, whimpering sounds, and he kind of hung his head, but he never, never produced a tear. I never saw a tear. He's still as arrogant as he was from the very beginning. Cocky and arrogant all the way to the end. Never mentioned his mother once. And I was very young, but it was such a horrible crime, and we felt like he knew what he was doing. I could be the biggest con man you ever knew. Because his crimes occurred in two separate episodes, roughly six months apart, Sean Sellers' pattern of criminal behavior best fits the criteria of a serial killing. According to the Behavioral Analysis Unit and the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crimes, Serial murder is defined by one or more offenders, two or more murdered victims, incidents occurring in separate events at different times, and the time period between the murders, usually a minimum of a one-month cooling-off period in between, separates serial murder from mass murder. But was Sean Sellers really a serial killer? While his anger control problems had escalated throughout his teens, there was no particular pattern or theme in his motivations to murder. There's nothing to suggest he extrapolated his anger against his mother towards females in general, as is often seen with male serial killers. While he reportedly received disciplinary infractions with regularity while in prison, there's no evidence that these incidents were related to violence. The McDonald Triad lists three childhood behaviors that may be early warning signs of a potential serial killer. Reckless fire setting, animal cruelty, and bedwetting beyond the age of 10. While no evidence supports any history of arson and little suggests a pension for mistreating animals. I ate a, fr a fr leg off of a live frog. Then you start sacrificing animals. Sellers reported continuing to struggle with bedwetting into the age of 13. Perhaps a more useful question would be, what would have happened if Sean Sellers had successfully duped the police in 1986? Having already killed Robert Bauer without consequence, he was already confident he could out with the authorities a second time. If, either through wit or sheer luck, he would have turned out to be correct, he would really have nothing deterring him from doing so again, either the next time he felt the situation called for it, or even if the mood struck him. The facts I've laid out here are based on police and court documents, public records, testimony, 
media analysis, and over a dozen interviews I've conducted so far. At the time I'm finishing this, additional records requests are still pending, and I intend to continue to research the victim's stories. This video is a basic overview of some of the points I'd hope to make. There are also a number of colorful side characters and turns of events throughout the story that are also worth exploring. Thank you for watching. Please comment, like, and share. Subscribe if you'd like to see more analysis of crime and society from a scientifically informed behavioral health perspective. Until next time.